Hello everyone, I'm Belinda and I'm Chance and this is the first podcast on our anti-contractor home series. Uh, the anti-contractor home is an idea that we have. Um, it's developed over the last 10 months where we renovated this first house that we bought. We used our background as architects and used YouTube and websites and all that as resources and basically did all our renovation work ourselves. So we want to use the lessons learned while we worked on this house towards building our new house. And we'd like to make it as anti-contractor home or homeowner DIY friendly as possible. So through these series of podcasts, we're going to try to define what that means in terms of the technology we use, the methods of construction, and even the design of the home itself. And so with each podcast, we're going to try to delve into a new technology or a new design method, a uh, way of looking at uh, building a home um, that is homeowner friendly and uh, it's done without the need of uh, having to use a contractor. So for this first episode, we're going to look at uh, the foundation of the home, literally. Start right from the base. Yeah, from the base because everything starts there. It's mm -hmm. sort of a ripple effect going up. Um, I mean, as you know, when you, you build a home, there's so much that's, that has to be done before you even start building walls or anything. And it, a lot of those are the utility services that uh, go underneath your house, your foundation. That's almost before foundations then. It is before yeah. foundation, yes. But you could design a foundation in such a way that utilities can be above it. Doesn't right, it yeah, it's a thing to consider. Lowered. Like with the two most common types of foundations used in the state of Texas, which is where we live, uh, there's slab on grade um, and there's pier and beam. And with a slab on grade foundation, you have to have all your plumbing and utilities ready to go beforehand before you pour the slab because once it's done, it's it's possible, but it's fairly difficult to dig underneath the foundation. Now with a pier and beam home, you can uh, you still need to locate your utilities. That's part of uh, building any house, but. Uh, the ability to have that crawl space under your home allows you the um, opportunity to access things like plumbing um, after the fact. So, yeah, well, like we said, in, in Texas, uh, there's two, the two most common types of foundations mm -hmm. are slab on grade or what is called a floating slab, and there's pier and beam. And um, I know up north, a uh, very common type of foundation is to do a uh, built-in foundation with a basement but which is odd because we're in the tornado zone and as you can just last week or two weeks ago we had a very bad tornado come through the dfw area and it's scary because most homes around here and i looked it up it's around 90 percent of homes are slab on grade and not pier and beam with no basements which doesn't seem sensible but think if you look at the soil we have here in texas in particular in north texas where we are uh, there is a few inches of actual soil and then it's clay, whether it be a, a foot, two feet, three feet. Mm -hmm. And then you get into bedrock. I mean, you're in, you're into solid rock very quickly. So think about how expensive it would be to chip out all of that rock to build a basement. So I'm, yeah. my, uh, thought is that's, that's a popular reason why, um, mm -hmm. slab on grade is used as yeah. opposed to digging in and building a basement. Okay. So those are the two most common types of yeah. uh, foundations used. And we, we want to, uh, we know our houses, our anti-contractor home is going to be built with one of these foundations, maybe some sort of hybrid, hybrid. of the two. Uh, but we want to investigate these and see what would be the most anti-contractor friendly or in other words, most low maintenance. We, whenever we were looking for houses, we walked through many homes that were uh, both pure and beam and slab, slab on, on grade. grade and a common factor in all of these uh, not all of them but 95 percent of them were they all had some shifting mm -hmm. and needed foundation work uh, you could tell by walking in if you were to set a ball at one end of the room it would roll mm -hmm. all the way to the other end of the room because this clay soil in north texas uh, moves constantly. So in buying our house, we knew it was, 
it inevitable that we were going yeah. to have to do uh, foundation work on it. And so that was one thing that we uh, uh, agreed with the um, seller that uh, that cost would be covered or that cost was taken into consideration whenever we bought the home. And so we have so limited experience with peer and beam other yeah. than having walked through homes. walked through those homes yeah and it's 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 very odd the the um the first impression you get if you're not accustomed to it if you're accustomed to a solid floor you you walk into a pier and beam home and it sounds hollow it almost sounds cheap it does but that is also a very common type of foundation used in million dollar homes it's not actually because i went on zillow and I, and I don't know if that's the best uh, resource, but I went to all the 500,000 plus dollar homes in this area and I went to their foundations. And it doesn't say peer and beam, it just says peers. And there's a guy I called out to our house to look at our driveway because it's cracking pretty bad. I was talking to him about foundations in the area and he was saying that all the million dollar homes in this are the custom homes, not even just the million dollar homes. But they all have concrete slab on piers. They're not pier and beam. So they pour the piers and then their slab sits on the piers. It's separated from the soil. But they're not pier and beam. Okay. They're beam not, being wooden wood, beams yes. or steel beams. Yeah. They are, so you don't get that hollow sound. Correct. So are they using, they're pouring a slab on top of the piers? Yes. So they're digging the piers down to bedrock and it's... Uh, that's what's, um, I mean, if you're going to buy a million dollar house or pay for a million dollar house to be built, you don't want to have to do foundation work three years into it. Mm -hmm. So you might as well fork up the money to dig some piers down to, uh, the rock and not have it shipped. Yeah. And you saw this area is so unpredictable. Like that guy I was talking to who came here, when he bought his home, their bedrock was 16 inches below their soil. So if they had to put piers in, it would hardly cost anything. But if you go to another area just across the street or something, across the highway in Texas, you could have bedrocks like 20 feet deep. It's it's crazy how different the areas are. Mm-hmm. Like and Fort so, Worth is very rocky. Yes. Compared to the Dallas area. Dallas area. Yeah. When it comes to building a house, you're going to need to get a uh, geotech to come out and mm-hmm. to survey the the ground and to see exactly how much soil soil you have, where that clay is, how thick that clay is, and where the rock is. So that's another thing I looked at, the geotechnical report required. And it's shocking that in Texas, government and commercial buildings are required to have professional geotechnical engineers and licensed bonded contractors, but residential construction do not. You don't even need to test the soil before you build houses. It is such a scam because they can just pour slab on gray, like the cheapest form of foundation, sell their homes, move to another area. And by the time your house starts shifting, you they're no longer responsible for it. Because even when you go to the courts in Texas, homeowners have very little power over home builders. It's a shame, it really is. And a lot of people out there who have lost a lot of money just because they, they, they have, there's nothing they can do. So once the home builders leave and they start seeing cracks in their walls, they just they have to deal with it themselves. Because their warranty is expired mm-hmm. on those foundations. Right. And think about how many suburbs are being built mm-hmm. in this area in, in cities around the states where yeah. uh, they're just throwing up houses as fast as they can. I mean, we live close to Frisco, which is one of the fastest growing cities in the United States. And every time we drive up there, there's, it, a, new there's a new community. development yeah. being built. And it's uh, those houses um, are being erected in, in a couple of months. And it, it's the the methods of construction cannot be ideal of that good yeah. Of quality. Yeah. To For do them to go quickly. up that fast. And also, uh, this other thing I found out is that anyone can set themselves up as a home builder contract in Texas. There's no licensing process and there's no minimum training standards. So anyone can be can build a home? Yep. Anyone can set themselves up as a home builder. You mean start a business as a yep. home builder? So we could start a business as a Building home builder? Homes. Yep. 
which is what we want to do because we want to build this yeah. home. So we might as well start a business yeah. to build this home because there's no licensing requirement. There's no, no minimum training standards, nothing. Foundation repairs is such a big deal in this area. There are so many companies and I, every time you walk around, you're going to see any home that we visited. They've either had foundation work done or they're going to require or they foundation need it. work. Right, yeah. This home that we bought, which was really surprising, it's a 60-year-old home and it had never had foundation work done. Those, we, we had to do it ourselves, but going 60 years without right. it is, is a big surprise. And it needed it, but it didn't need near as much as the other homes. I mean, we yeah. did not have to... Uh, break up any uh concrete inside the house it was all on the uh, perimeter of the home mm -hmm. and in the garage so we got lucky that yes way. that re we were able to keep our flooring in yeah. and uh didn't have to worry about that i was going to get into something when it when you came to building developing homes and not having to to have any sort of license or anything so when you you actually build a house Though you have to have some sort of structural, I'm not going to say professional, but you, you have to have some someone sign also, off on your your structural. But that's work. that. <clears throat> there's a minimum square footage for that. Yeah, just like with architects, there's a minimum yes. square footage. You have to be or a licensed either. architect to. There used to be a, at least, because in a firm that I worked at, um, one of the guys who was an architect in training was. Uh, asking another architect, hey, do I need to get this, I don't know, commercial uh, building stamped by a licensed architect? And he said, no, as long as it's under X square footage, you, you don't need it done in, in Texas or in South Texas, wherever, whatever the uh, regulations are in that area. Mm -hmm. So you can have engineers designing houses, which is right. what happens yes. a lot of the time. <laughs> and engineers can sign off on trades that, that they were not... Uh, trained in. Trained in, yeah, for example... In, yeah. Um, my brother, who's a professional mechanical engineer, could sign off on a set of structural drawings. Wow. He's a little scared to do that. <laughs> but So that, I just wanted to mention that because uh, I didn't know that about uh, anyone can yeah. build a house. and that's, Set themselves up as a home builder. Yeah. yeah. So what, what happened in Dallas is before 1970, they were building a lot of pier and beam homes in the area. After 1970, 90% of homes built were slab on grid. And like this home, for example, they used to, from 1970 to 2000, till 2000, all they had to do was dig up the soil, have, uh, have four to six inches of gravel, then have some sort of like moisture barrier, put their rebar in, like uh, cr crosshead rebar as reinforcement, and then just pour concrete right over it. That was, that was like the, Typical, easiest, cheapest slab on grade. How does that differ from today's slab on grade method? In 2000, so from 1970 to 2000, that's what they did. In 2000, they started with post-tension slabs. Yes. So the slabs got thicker and they started drilling holes at the end of the slabs and pulling this rebar out to like post-tension it once the concrete had cured. That seems really expensive. It was slightly more expensive, but... Um, that was just the, the trend that the market moved towards. Okay, so you're, you're not saying that homes today are built with post-tension slabs? They, they are. Commonly? I'm not sure of the percentage. You think they still just I, I don't, pour it? They I don't. don't think there's many because post-tension can be very expensive. I mean, that stuff is... Those things are tensioned to, to such a pressure that if mm. they... They were to snap or something that cable would fly through your house and crack up all your concrete and mm. i mean there yeah there's been stories of that kind of thing happening on commercial buildings which post tension is very common it with, cuts through the concrete commercial buildings yes if they Whoa. if they break through the cured concrete yes so that guy that i called to look at our driveway he was saying that homes nowadays have much thicker concrete slabs so like in our home the concrete slab sits on this expansive clay soil and the edges of it start cracking whenever the soil gets dried out, okay? That's the typical common um, issue. What they're doing nowadays is they're making the slabs thicker so the entire house is tilting rather than just corners of it breaking off. So that makes it more expensive to do foundation work because you're going to have 
four times the number of piers to make your house level again rather than just lifting those slabs out. So when he was talking about that, you don't think he was talking about post-tensioned slabs? Like the thicker slabs? Again, I think th- I feel like that would be expensive, more expensive than just setting your rebar and pouring uh, a slab on top of that. So maybe he was talking about custom custom home slabs? Perhaps. So if, like whether you're buying a $200,000 home or a $400,000 home, you think they're all just regular rebar rebar enforced slab on it? There's I do. There's no difference? I do. Wow. But, anyway, the uh, PSI. Yeah, yeah. So uh, post-tension slabs, it looks like, are tensioned to a uh, about 33,000 pounds of load. Um, and so you have to get qualified workers to come out and stress wow. those. And so to me, that, that seems like a few extra steps you would have to take. And all those extra steps are more expensive, yeah. more contractors, more professionals to sign off on things. Hmm. But homeowners like it because it feels more solid, yes. for sure. And also you don't have rodents getting in like you, you, like you do with pier and beam. Home builders like it because it's fast and cheap. Yes. Like the turn around once you pour that slab in a couple of days, you can start putting a. And I would up. say homeowners like that. It's cheap as well. I mean, it's it's a cheaper method, less yeah. expensive mm-hmm. than pier and beam. Yes. And also, I think everyone just thinks in the short short term now. Everyone thinks, okay, I'm just going to be here for three to five years, once I like construct my home and then flip it around and and sell it. And in five years, I'm just gambling on whether I'm going to have foundation issues in those five years and are you saying developers or homeowners both developers are probably just going to run away by that time but homeowners <laughs> if they're if they're trying to cut costs and build a home build a they, custom home build their own custom home that you just want to sell they yeah just i'm sure at the beginning they have uh thoughts of building the the best quality home the most energy efficient home mm-hmm. and B-E, then when, right? when price comes in <laughs> into play, they realize that's not going to Value gonna engineering. Yes. Or you just go way over budget, which these are things we want to consider for our anti-contractor home. We yeah. Definitely, uh, we, we, there are definitely pros to the slab on grade. I like the solidity of it. Like I grew up in, in Dubai and they don't have wood over there. So no one builds anything with wood. It's all CMU block. So everything was the solid, you know, you don't just walking through a house here that's made out of wood feels wrong. Feels weird. Yeah. It just, yeah. Which there, and there's, uh, some people really like that, that feel it's sort of gives a a comfort, like, um, like a cabin feel you think? Yes. Yeah. Mm. It's sort of got that. Uh, farmhouse, farmhouse, yeah, that's what you said. there you go. That's <laughs> what I was trying to say. So gives it that farmhouse See, I listen to you. And, so, and also that uh, whenever you're walking through your house throughout the day, if you're walking on wood versus solid concrete, your feet are going to appreciate that much more. It, it can be very tiring on your feet to, to walk so. on solid concrete versus that, that flexible wood flooring. Getting to... A little bit about pier and beam. So pier and beam is a, uh, for one, it's a more expensive type of um, foundation. Why is, why is it more expensive? Because you have to have special equipment to drill down to bedrock and get those piers poured. Mm. So it's concrete piers going to bedrock and then it's wood beams sitting on those concrete piers? Not necessarily wood, but it is it is beams and joists um that that frame out your floor structure so you kind of create a grid of e- made out of either wood or concrete yes, and, and, and then well wood steel or concrete Tip, okay. the most typical thing used is two by tens and two by twelves okay uh, two by twelves for your beams two by tens for your joists and they're like pressure treated exterior grade wood yes okay so that would be the most common floor and then you put your uh your sheathing above that uh your three quarter inch osb or something like that and then you would put your floor on top of that, but you have to insulate the underside. So it's, is it built out? Like you have a frame down here as your crawl space and then you have your home above that? Like they, Because there's some crawl space underneath, right? Right. So above your pier and beam and your joists and everything, do they like add a couple of feet and then they put the floor? No, the Where floor the sits crawl? on the, Directly the beams on that. and the joists, yeah. Okay. 
So the crawl space is like you can see the piers and yeah. all that. So the and, piers will like extend up from the the ah. soil like twelve to eighteen inches, and on top of the piers, you're putting your beams and your joists, and then on top of that, you have your sheathing and your flooring. Okay. So the underside of um, your house has to be insulated, or else all that cold air going under the crawl space would be uh, would get into your. Yes. So in Breaking Bad, um, when they had that guy hidden in their basement, that was Jesse Pinkman's house. But in um, what is his name? Walt. Walt. Yeah. Yes. In his house, when he had those rotten beams and joists that he was replacing, did he have? Was that, that a basement? Yeah, that wasn't a full size basement. That was definitely a crawl space because it was about eighteen twenty four inches. Because he could get in there, but not. Not, not much walk else. around in there, right? Yeah, and that's all. That's where he stored um, stored his money, and it was a a dark space, but it seemed like a conditioned space. So there's two types of uh, crawl spaces you can have for pier and beam. There is a uh, a conditioned space and an unconditioned space. So the unconditioned space would be uh, what you think of with a farmhouse uh, style home, where you built the piers and you can actually see under the house. That's where you hear the stories of all the, oh, yeah, the raccoons, the rodents and stuff got under my house and they started chewing through everything. So you can see under the house from the outside? Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's how the, the animals. When you see like the panel and all that. And right. Yeah. Some people will put some sort of mesh. a wood panel skirt around the house and then they'll uh -huh. put these mesh openings to allow air to go through. Because if you were to completely uh, close that off, you would risk the uh, uh, it being Rotten. moisture getting in there and mold developing under your house and uh so that that is the unconditioned space and then the conditioned space is actually where they do the pier and beams and then they build they pour a concrete uh wall perimeter wall uh to enclose the crawl space and in that case you can condition the space and it would stay much cleaner but uh you would also have to be sure to use a uh, vapor barrier on the outside and insulate those concrete walls for sure or else you would let all that cold air cold. or warm air get through the house so when it's wood how often do, do those joists and beams have to be replaced it's still wood that's that's a good question uh, that was one of the the things I was considering is how difficult it is to replace one of those so, beams yeah. or joists or the uh, subfloor sheathing. Now, so, when, so when Shan says Sanchez Foundation came to do our foundation work, I was talking to the lady who owns it, and she was saying that pure and beam is everyone thinks that pure and beam foundation work is the cheap is cheaper than slab on grade, but she was saying it's not necessarily the case because sometimes if you just let your pure and beam home be and you're not taking care of it you can have the entire peers and and have to be replaced and that's sometimes more expensive than just putting a couple of concrete peers to replace a slab on to fix a slab on grade house i would think that's because with a slab on grade house the whole thing acts as your peers and beams. I mean, the whole thing acts as one monolithic piece mm -hmm. versus with a pier and beam construction. If you need to replace a pier or modify a few piers, you're taking all the load off of that area or in, in certain mm -hmm. cases, multiple areas. And so you have to support it. Support somehow. it underneath yes. while you pull that out and replace another right. one. Hmm. Yeah. But but with, with, with slab on grade, when you have foundation issues, it means that your slab is cracked and the ends of it have fallen right down so all you're doing is picking those ends up right and so with a pier and beam if you were to have foundation issues there you can have still to be shifting like for example your your pier could tilt at a, at a certain angle and that caused your mm -hmm. house to shift like a warp bit. yes so we know how much wood yeah. warps so so yeah. you want yes and that's a, another thing um it could be seen as a disadvantage uh the beams and joists that you use if they're made of wood will deteriorate over yeah. time and that can cause your floor to sag as well mm. but think about how expensive it would be to replace let's say a joist because you're going to have many joists running along your beams uh, or perpendicular to your beams and so you could just knock one out replace it with a new one and you're good to go uh, versus uh, if you have 
sagging or shifting in your concrete, uh, your your slab break on grade. Through. Yeah, you have to break through the concrete. You yeah. have to uh, jackhammer. And when you it. do that, you're com you're compromising on the the structural integrity because you're breaking through the rebar. The rebar too. Yeah. To get to it and then yeah. Jack and if it. you had a post tension slab and you broke through the rebar, oh, that's bad news. That would be very bad news. Yes. Wow. But if you do a post tension slab, it's probably going to hold together better. So the whole thing shifts. Right. <laughs> But when the whole thing <coughs> shifts, then how do they get underneath to jack it up? Dig. From the sides, they can't, yeah. they go, can't go straight down. Yeah, I would think, oh. yeah, jackhammering through a post-tension slab is just a recipe for disaster. So that's why it gets like four times more expensive. That's what that guy mm -hmm. said. Oh, one, one thing about pier and beam is that it is a more expensive method of building a foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, from what I saw, it, it it's going to be about five dollars per square foot for an unconditioned pier and beam uh foundation and if you were to condition it that price is going to go up to eight or nine dollars per uh, square foot uh, mm -hmm. because you have to consider the uh, vapor barrier the insulation around mm -hmm. uh, the perimeter as well how Which, do is there a way to make pier and beam houses feel less hollow yes there is well for one you could do the method that you talked about where you have your piers and then you pour a slab on top of that. That's still considered pure and beam? Well, your piers are going, if your piers are going down to rock, then mm. yes. But another uh, e example or another uh, method often used, and it's used more on custom homes, more modern homes, is uh, hollow core concrete panels. Okay. Uh, where they would prefab all these concrete panels and bring them in and set them, set them on, on your, you would have to have steel uh, piers, okay. I mean steel beams and joists uh, or concrete. And then you would uh, have your hollow concrete panels and that would give you a much more solid feel. That's, uh, that's often a uh, method used in building apartments. Okay. Not all apartments, but some apartments will use this hollow uh, core concrete panel. So that could give you a, a more solid feel mm -hmm. but the so, question is how expensive is something like that going to be yeah uh, so pier and beam is better than slab on grade in this area with the expansive clay soils because you have a separation from the soil your house is less likely to shift if you do a pier and beam house versus a slab on grade house because the soil can expand and contract yes. and it doesn't affect your house because it's sitting above it now slab on grade is going to be cheaper Mm -hmm. But consider, uh, from what I saw, the cost of one foundation repair is going to even out the price between slab on grade versus pier and beam. Mm -hmm. Now, with pier and beam, there's lots of consideration on what you would use as your joists, as your beams, as your, um, your it's floor. It's a lot more open. There's so many materials you can use. Pier and beam is not just wood. Like you said, you can use metal, you can use right. concrete. You, mm -hmm. It's a very open-ended mm -hmm. concept. Yes. Much more friendly to uh, different design aesthetics. Yeah. And I mean, if I were to have my personal preference, it would be pier and beam so you don't have the foundation shifts. And then for the beams, uh, I would like to use steel. And then the joist would be steel as well and then How expensive is that gonna be? then you would have hollow core concrete uh panels on top to not have the the hollow sound that you get with a pier and beam home mm. now those are probably the most expensive materials but my experience with wood has led me to want to avoid that yes. uh material at all costs coming to new technologies i've come across three in this area, in the Dallas DFW area, that they're almost a hybrid of the two that we've talked about, hybrid of slab on grade and pier and beam. They're trying to get the best of both and put it together into this new, cheaper, more efficient technology. And they call it greener too because it requires lesser materials and less water. They account for amount of concrete you use as less water. Mm -hmm. So. One of them I want you to look at is Waffle Mat. I just I found that this morning. I just sent you the link to it. And it's very interesting. So what Waffle Mat is, is they dig out a volume of soil where you want to place your foundation. And then they put these plastic tubs all over your 
foundation area. It kind of looks like a waffle, hence the name. And these plastic tubs are like thermal grade, heat resistant, and they're patented plastic forms. And oh, I want to see this guy bulldoze this tree. <laughs> yeah, it's that easy to get rid of trees, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I see the uh, the plastic uh, the plastic tubs. tubs, and then they attach. There's only one way to pour this, so you can't mess it up. That's that's what they claim. Now, what is this blue? Is this that's uh, just reinforcement? Like oh, okay, rebar. that's rebar. Okay, yeah, it's rebar. I wasn't sure if that was some sort of it's underfloor like flexible, radiant heating system rebar. being <laughs> put in. And then they just pour the concrete right over it, so underneath it's hollow because the concrete has cured over these plastic forms. Are these these plastic forms? They they're, they're embedded in the concrete. You don't remove them. Okay. So it's using less concrete than a regular uniform thickness slab or a ribbed slab. And I think what we have is a uniform thickness slab. So, so this is a very interesting graphic. So when it rains and your soil, especially in Texas, expands to 30% of its volume, it's going to crack your the edges of your slab. Or even when it dries out, it's going to crack the edges of your slab. But what they're claiming is because of this waffle shape, soil can slide underneath it, yes it can slide into those holes and it's it maintains its form okay that's that that was interesting so so that's that's what combats the the shifting yes the okay so there's another one that's a variation of this waffle mat it's still nothing they don't have peers or anything this is just a new form a new type of slab on grade yes okay yeah, it's there's a company called Sure Void, and they do the same thing as Waffle Mat, except that they use cardboard boxes instead of plastic tubs, which is crazy. Paper in construction, you think it would just soak up all the moisture, but these cardboard boxes are obviously lined with some sort of plastic. Um, so they put these cardboard boxes all over your foundation, and they use piers, I think. They, they definitely have piers in their construction. Um, and they pour concrete over it once they reinforce it. And the idea of sure void is that these cardboard boxes are going to disintegrate over time when the soil sure underneath void. it um, soaks up, when the cardboard soaks up the moisture from the soil underneath it. So when the cardboard disintegrates, it leaves voids under your foundation. And then you have the same, the ability for the soil to slide up underneath. Yes. So the the advantage of this over waffle mat is that it's biodegradable. It's cardboard yes, rather than yes. using plastic so tubs. Using the plastic, it's going to stay there. Yeah. So these cardboard boxes create a temporary support platform for you to pour all this concrete over it. Okay. But when I was looking it up, it's not as straightforward as waffle mat because sure void like waffle mat is one thing. It's a plastic tub. Sure Void has a bunch of different materials. They've got different size boxes. There are hundreds of ways to like put it together. And it's not, you can mess it up. It's mm. not as easy as Waffle Mat. So you would need an engineer to design this waffle grid. Yes. Uh, to be the most mm -hmm. uh, efficient. So what they recommend on their website is once, like, you, once you dig up the the soil around these piers like there's you have to put a different size box in those slabs and then you have these mounds over it like your waffles you have a different size box for that you have a different size box for the walls they've got so many products okay but it's not it's not as straightforward yes so this this sounds very uh this sounds like it's getting into the realm of being expensive yeah uh more than your traditional pier and beam or slab on grade. I think it works for commercial spaces. I don't think it's going to work for a small residential. So this, um, Let me send you that link. The, the question is, is this waffle mat um, going to be as expensive as a pier and beam? In mm -hmm. which case, why not just use pier and beam? Because it's still technically slab on grade. So you're, you're, all your... The, you're just paying for the plastic tubs. That's it. The benefit you're getting is... Uh, the solid feel yeah. for the ground. And it's fast, just as fast as slab on grade because you just place those plastic tubs, attach them to each other and pour your concrete. But you have to have a professional engineer design your waffle mat grid. Uh, yeah, I guess so. 
I'm, I'm not. I'm not so an I'd be interested to to get a quote and compare that to what a, a pier and beam would be, especially a pier and beam with, uh, let's say, steel beams, uh, steel joists, and uh, hollow concrete panels. So one thing that that's not so DIY friendly or anti contractor home friendly about slab on grade or any or the either of these technologies is that I don't know if you noticed in some of those graphics you see your plumbing being done beforehand and it's um, sticking out yes through it's the, sticking yes. out through your slab yes so if anything goes wrong yes if you have any sort of issues uh, breakthrough any sort of leaks or anything underneath your slab you're going to have to either jackhammer your slab or have someone dig a tunnel from the side of your house underneath which is what that guy you know just had to do right yes he had, he had a he leak had a, and was coming the water was sh- like penetrating through the slab up to his flooring right and it was a hot water lake so that got very expensive yeah um so the pier and beam idea allows you to have access yes have access to these utilities the only thing that's going to be underground is your connection to your main sewer line or your main water line uh for the city so you have that ability to uh, maintain it. So what about this this last one I want to show you? It's called Tela Firma. And I, th- I believe they started this in Texas. Yeah, they're based in Richardson, Texas. Okay. So what they are trying to do is the foundations that people use in high-end homes. They are trying to take that same logic and provide it to everyone else at a reduced cost. They have developed a slightly different version of that same technology and reduce the price of it and then, that's the key the lifting mechanism that that patented lifting mechanism so separating the concrete from slab the from soil. the soil mm-hmm. it's almost like an independent slab it's still sitting on those piers but it's not fixed so it's exactly Lift like a up. pier and beam mm-hmm. it's just with a it's a that's the hybrid of okay. the two now, they, do they have to post tension the slab afterwards? Probably because it's set on such oh, such fine yeah. points. I don't. I didn't see anything about post tension. Well, I, the the this video right here shows that it is post tension cables sticking out of the side, um, and I would think that would hold hold it together much better. Uh, it's very interesting, and also they are. I, I read about this helical piers that they use. It requires less concrete than the typical piers, so it's cheaper. That's how they reduce okay. the cost. But they have to drill deeper probably with those. Why? Because they're smaller. Compared to concrete cased piers, helical piers offer faster insulation, less dependence on weather, and reduction of labor I- related errors, all re- while requiring less concrete. Didn't say anything about it having to go deeper than concrete piers. Okay. So because this, like with, with concrete piers, you have to first drill out all the material in that, all the earth in there, mm-hmm. and then pour, like add your rebar, add your reinforcement, and then pour concrete. With your helical piers, you just like rotate those into the soil all the way to bedrock. You don't have to dig out all the material first. It's a structural material that you... Which are made of steel? Yes. Okay. Okay, yes. so the piers there... Uh, they're using they're earth. structural in itself okay so they just put that through the earth i see okay Saves so it's time. like they're taking the bit they would use to drill correct uh, and then and leaving the bit in leave there the bit in there <laughs> yeah and is that the the uh, piece that, that is threaded on the end that allows them to lift the house up Ooh. is that part of the uh, the pier maybe i have to look into this so a little bit more. So they encase it in concrete mm-hmm. just up to the top or they pour concrete all the way so through? if you see what that is it's like they they put they put that hill. They drill the helical pier in it, and then just keep pushing it down till they hit bedrock, and then they pour the concrete around it. I believe. What's interesting is that I see this quote. This is on a four hundred thousand dollar home. The uh, Tela Firma approach would cost four thousand more than a slab on grade foundation, but fifteen thousand less than a pier and beam foundation. You're drilling piers you're doing a slab on grade and you're post tensioning the slab. Yeah. I, I don't see how that, how can that be would be cheaper than cheaper. just a pier and beam or just a slab. Well, okay. It's not cheaper than just a slab on grade. They're admitting that, but mm-hmm. get a quote for a, uh, fictitious house on a fictitious <laughs> site. <laughs> what was the most anti-contractor aspects of these, of everything that we talked about? 
something that's going to last. Right. Yeah. And so it, to me, uh, it seems like a peer and beam is going to be less likely to have foundation issues as far as having a foundation repair company come out and repair your peers versus a slab on gray. We know that that just done in Texas, just a typical slab on grade is going to have issues. issues. Yes. So the key is some sort of separation from your soil. That's what we need yes. in our house. So whether it, it be can't just sit directly on the soil, some in some way, whether it's a lifting mechanism, whether it's slab on grade, it just has to have separation from the clay soil. Yes. And so you have to have piers down to the rock. Yes. In order to get that separation movement. I think hiring a geotechnical engineer is very important when building a custom home. Why? Getting soil tests and hiring a geo because they just if you're doing if you uh, like intend on pouring piers and you have to know where your bedrock is. Right, but you wouldn't have, wouldn't the people who are drilling those piers go down until they hit bedrock? To, yeah, but how are you going to account for cost if you don't know where your but your bedrock is, it could be 5,000 or they start drilling and it's, hey, it's 50,000 because it's that deep. Get a quote with a maximum. But they still have to do some tests to find out where it is. Okay. And so if you, you hire a geotechnical engineer to do all that, you're better prepared. Your estimate's going to be more accurate. It would probably be more accurate. And also, you know what soil you're dealing with whether it really is clay soil or something else. And that could help you... Design your slab better. You, yeah, can't, you can't design it without knowing what you're, what, you're, you're, what you're dealing with. Right. It could allow you to find the best spot on your site to Correct. go yeah. within the constraints mm-hmm. of your setbacks. So it it blows my mind. Like I contacted a real estate agent to find some land in the area. And the first thing they asked is, you have, a, you have a design in mind? You have a house that you've designed and you know what it's going to look like? Like, no, you can't just pick a picture of the internet and say, this is what I want it to look like. I want it to be placed right in the middle of my site. That's crazy. Yes. Uh, as architects, we, uh, we learned that uh, your, your site, uh, build with site in mind. Yeah. You can't do the, take the modernist approach and just build whatever you want. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't overpower the site because we know nature will always win. Yep. Like you said, a different part of the site might be better to be to build on. All the other constraints, the, the design comes after you know what your site is and what the soil is, where your bedrock is, all that stuff. Hmm. The geotech would just tell us about soil, so then we'd have to hire a, uh, a civil engineer as well to tell us where our point of connections are. Mm-hmm. So coming to point of connections, we want to design this house some way that all our utilities are above the above the slab. We do not want want anything to run under the slab that we so that it's inaccessible. Yes, we want to be able to see to access every um, foot of our plumbing systems or yeah. our electrical systems mm-hmm. or our HVAC systems. And you can design a house in that way. It's just not done, but we it can be done. Yes. Remember that church we used to go to? <laughs> yes. Oh, that when they were de- building their expansion, they had the same issue. They didn't. They estimated where their their bedrock was, and they had to double the cost of foundation because the bedrock was twice as That's deep. That's true. Yes, the takeaway from that was to hire a geotechnical yeah. engineer. Uh, so, if we were to use a pier and beam, we would have to consider what type of beams we would use. Yes. Whether the beams be wood and be sounds like we're leaning towards anything but wood. Right. Right. So steel or a concrete. method of concrete that is post tension that is lifted from the soil. So some method of this telefirma. Yeah. It? Yeah. Telefirma. Get a quote from them. Uh, compare beam. that to a pure and beam quote with steel joists and a hollow concrete slab. Yes. With both of those methods, you'd have to drill through concrete to get your plumbing systems up mm-hmm. from the crawl space. So we have to design the home in such a way that those systems are above the slab and not below. They're accessible to us at any point. Above the crawl space? Uh, above the slab. Above. Well, I guess it depends. If you're doing the telephone above the slab. If you're having 
if you're going to have a PN beam above the crawl space. Yeah, which or oh, some sort of access point in the crawl space where right, it all comes right. out. Right, right, which yeah. could be a conditioned crawl space. Could be a conditioned um, crawl space. Yeah, where you can have access. I even had the thought of a, a crawl space that is magnified, like your house is lifted up three, four feet off the ground so that you can... Uh, so would that just be a basement? Well, if it's unconditioned, uh, then it would just it would be like a house on stilts that you see mm-hmm. by the beach. But with that, you could have better access to everything under your slab um, and you could better maintain it from uh, rodents, be, it being rodent infested and yeah. stuff like that. Now, if you had a conditioned deep crawl space that would basically turn into a basement yeah sounds good try to get some quotes what do you want to discuss next week i think um we've mentioned it a couple of times something that you have to consider utilities very early stages is is utilities Mm. in particular the plumbing that goes into your house because you have to have that figured out before your foundation comes if it's going through your foundation yeah so let's tackle that next week all right yeah Plumbing systems. We yeah. have a little more experience with that since we worked yes. on plumbing in this house. Absolutely. It is a broad topic. Well, let's the let's not keep let's not discuss plumbing going up above the slab. Let's say plumbing underneath. Okay. I mean, let's say the plumbing that gets to to your house, to your services, to your water heater, so that from there we can take it, and that can be a whole different podcast where we discuss methods what happens of from using there. Yeah. yeah from there around the house. Mm -hmm. Thanks for for listening. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.